And we'll be in Matthew chapter 16, and we're looking at verses 13 to 20 this morning. So let's ask the Lord to bless us. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. I pray that it would nourish our hearts and our souls this morning, that we would be spiritually fed. We thank you, Lord, that we we don't live on bread alone, but from every word that comes from you. And so we ask this morning that your word indeed would nourish us and sustain us as we look to Christ for all things. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 16. So a big topic that we're going to be looking at this morning. A big turning point in the gospel of Matthew. Peter's confession of faith. Let's read verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? So Jesus and his disciples, they had just had that pretty discouraging conversation with the religious leaders, if you remember the last time I was up here, um, where Jesus warned them to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, this this stony-hearted unbelief, demanding signs of God, not in order to believe, but seeking simply to discredit Jesus. And Jesus He spoke a word of warning to those people, and now he is taking his disciples north, about 40 kilometers north of the Sea of Galilee, really into the the historic limits of Israel in the Old Testament, going back to the time of Judges. At this time, Caesarea Philippi is predominantly a Gentile, pagan territory, there are temples to Augustus, there are temples to the god Pan. It's a perfect symbol, really, of the religious pluralism of the Roman Empire. You have everyone free to worship a god of their own choosing. And not only that, but you have this deification of political power. Temples to emperors, temples to so-called gods and deities, rituals, the burning of incense, prayers, sacrifices. All of these things happening. And Jesus brings his disciples there. He brings them into a microcosm of the world, you could say. The Romans, at this time, they, they pretty much believed that every religion that was practiced in their empire, and there were many, they generally held to the view that every religion was equally true, equally false, and equally useful. You were free to make a god of your own choosing. We're a long way from Jerusalem. We're a long way from monotheism. In many ways, this is a world alien to the disciples who grew up in Galilee, who grew up with the synagogue, who grew up going to Jerusalem three times a year for their pilgrim festivals. Now they stand in the the swirling chaos and noise of paganism with its many ways to God, with its many definitions of God, with its many understandings of of the human existence, of the afterlife, if there even is an afterlife. As many gods as you want, as many gods as you need. Many ways to God, many gods to choose from.
And it is here in Caesarea, in Caesarea Philippi, not in Jerusalem, not at the temple of the Most High God, but it's here that Jesus asks the all important question Who do people say that the Son of Man is? It's a very important question. <laughs> Who do people say that the Son of Man is? In the Gospels, Jesus very rarely, we have an example in John's Gospel, but there are very few occasions where Jesus describes himself as the Messiah, as the Mashiach. He doesn't deny that he is. In fact, when the Samaritan woman says that we are waiting for the Messiah, Jesus says, he that speaks with you is he. But the most common way that Jesus refers to himself in his ministry is by this strange title, the Son of Man. And if you know the Old Testament, in particular the, the book of Daniel, the title, the Son of Man, is a title of divinity. In Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel has his vision of the future persecution of God's people, where God's people suffer because of the beasts and uh, this apocalyptic imagery of, of the horn that foreshadows the coming Antichrist. Amidst all this chaos, amidst all this persecution, amidst the alienation of God's people, there comes one Daniel sees in his vision like a son of man. And it's to him, the son of man, that all kingdoms and all glory and all power and authority is given. And the nations and the people will serve him. And if you know the book of Daniel, that's the big question. Who will you serve? And for God's exiles in the book of Daniel, they were determined to serve none but God. And Daniel, in his night vision, sees the one whom he would serve. And all nations would serve. The one who comes into the presence of the Ancient of Days, the one described as the Son of Man. So Jesus is asking a big question here. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Let's look at the response. The disciples, they say, well, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Who would be this man that was going to come? Who would indeed be God's anointed in Psalm 2? Who indeed would be the one to whom the people would serve in Daniel 7. Who would be the one who would take upon himself the kingdom of God? The promised Messiah, the promised son of David who was to come. There were many opinions. Perhaps the son of man is a forerunner. Perhaps the son of man is, is someone else entirely. Some of the answers that they got, John the Baptist, perhaps he was the son of man. Elijah, one of the prophets who had maybe come before the final inauguration of the kingdom of God, perhaps Jeremiah, perhaps one of the other prophets. Many different opinions. Some say this, some say that. That's what the people are talking about. It's no different today, is it really? When the question is asked, who is Jesus Christ? Some will say he is a teacher, he was a revolutionary, he was a prophet. Some would say he is and was a heretic, a blasphemer, a drunkard, a sorcerer. Or some would say, well, he is a God. He is a way. But there are many ways. 
so many answers, so many opinions. In verse 15, Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? This is the first time that Jesus asks his disciples this question directly. Up until now, he has shown the disciples who he is. He has modeled for them who he is. He has demonstrated in his words and in his ministry who he is. But now he asks his disciples directly, who do you say that I am? And this, brothers and sisters, is the question that you must answer. Because there is coming a day when you will stand before God. Assuredly. And so this answer is not an academic question. This is the most fundamental existential question of the human existence. Who do you say that Jesus Christ is? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ the Son of the living God. And that is one of the most important confessions of faith in the Scriptures. That you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Notice Peter doesn't say, well, that's what the world says, but to us you are the Christ. The Son of the Living God. Or even say, Well, I feel for me, you are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. He didn't say, Well, I think that you are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. No, Peter spoke the truth when he said, You are the Christ. The Son of the living God. And this, brothers and sisters, is the bedrock of the Christian faith. It is built on the confession that Jesus Christ is indeed the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And everything else that the church does and teaches, it flows from that central truth of who Jesus Christ is. And there is coming a day, brothers and sisters, when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It is the most important question. And Jesus asks this question in the midst of a world lost, in idolatry and unbelief and false religion and ritualism and pride. And as the prayers and the incense is going up to Pan and Augustus and the pantheon of false gods, Peter stood and he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wherever Christ is proclaimed, there is the church. Because Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the church exists as the body of Christ, a people redeemed who belong to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The church confesses with Peter, That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the church seeks to explain and to unpack that. And we profess that Jesus is indeed God. 
very God, true God of true God, light from light, that He is indeed the only begotten Son of God, begotten, not born, born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, who died, was buried and rose again on the third day and now sits at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Brothers and sisters, everything that we believe and teach and seek to impart, it flows from this confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. What is Christ? What is Christos? When Matthew was writing this gospel, he's writing in Greek. And he's seeking to put into the Greek language this concept in the Old Testament of the Anointed One, the Mashiach. There's no exact word for that in Greek. And so the best they could come up was Christos. The smeared one. But what Matthew is writing about and what Peter confessed when he said that you are the Christ. Peter is saying that you, Jesus, you are the fulfillment of every promise that God gave to us and to our forefathers. You, Jesus, You are the embodiment. You are the answer to what our forefathers prayed for and longed for. You are what the prophets said would come. You are what the Torah describes. You are what the temple personifies. You are the promise of God's salvation. You are the Christ, the true son of David, who will rule a kingdom without end. You are not one of many. You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God, divine sonship. A mystery, certainly, that Peter, in all likelihood, does not even fully understand. And I would confess the church still does not fully understand the incredible mystery of the incarnation that God, through his eternal word, the Son of God, would step into creation that he would take upon himself our human nature, that that union of the divine nature and the human nature would exist in a perfect harmony and union in the one person of Jesus Christ. It is a mystery like none other, but it is the reason for our salvation. For if Jesus was not the Son of the living God, then who died on the cross? A prophet? A politician? A failed rebel leader? No, brothers and sisters. The mystery of the cross is that the eternal word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that in Christ, God took our place. That is why Paul says that the beauty of the gospel is that it is the righteousness of God revealed. The cross is the work of God for you. It is not the work of a philosopher. It is not the work of a religious leader. Not the work of a prophet. It is the work of God. And it is the work of God who through Jesus Christ took upon himself our very nature to stand in our place and to give us his righteousness and to take upon himself the judgment. You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God, Peter says. 
Jesus answered him. This is one of the rare occasions where Peter actually got an answer right. Okay, so this is good. Jesus answered him. He said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus says, you're blessed, Peter. God's grace has touched you. Your confession, Peter, that's the overflow of the work of God in your life. That's the touch of the Spirit. Any time that a Christian confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, they are blessed. Because no one can say that apart from the grace of God. No one will come to say that through their own strength and ability, through flesh and blood, through their own intellect and reasoning. They will come to that through the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus says, Peter, you're blessed. You're blessed by God because you have said that. Because you were able to say that, you are blessed by God. The truth of salvation is that it rests in the grace of God. It rests in what God does for us. Grace is God doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. It wasn't that Peter was paying attention more than any of the other disciples. It wasn't that maybe he just had a better grasp on things. No, it was because Peter was blessed by the grace of God that he could stand there and say, you are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God. There is no doubt in my mind, it is you, Jesus. It's always been that way. Salvation is always the work of God for us. It is always a gift. It is always God's grace. It is never merited. It is never given as a wage. It is always given freely by the hand of God to a people who do not deserve it. Paul could summarize it this this way in Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What Peter demonstrates here is, I think, one of the central truths of the Christian life, which is Peter demonstrates faith seeking understanding. Peter has put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because his faith is in the Lord, that faith is spurring him on to seek to understand the person of Jesus. And Jesus says that you are blessed, Peter, because this is not the result of your own effort. It is not flesh and blood that has revealed this to you. It is not your human nature. It is the work of God. The entire Christian discipleship and life is always faith seeking understanding. It is not that we get to a place of understanding in order to believe, but that we believe in order that we will understand. Faith is not in contradiction to understanding. It is the way into understanding. And Peter isn't fully there yet. And we'll talk about this next week, the great great rebuke. But this morning, what we are seeing is a faith-seeking understanding. It is not a perfect understanding. There are still many aspects that Peter doesn't fully grasp. But that confession comes not from a place of human intellect. What Peter confesses at Caesarea Philippi, it comes from the grace of God. 
Blessed are you, Peter. The flesh and blood did not reveal this. But my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, he says in verse 18, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whoever you bind on earth and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Those verses were not controversial in the early church. Now, later on in the medieval ages, yeah, these became a battleground. But in the early church, this was not a contentious passage. If you look at the, the understanding of the early church, if you look at Chrysostom, Augustine, Cyprian, these early church leaders that explained and exegeted Matthew's gospel, there, there is no confusion here. When Peter says you are, or when Christ says to Peter, you are the rock, and on this rock I will build my church. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. What's happening here is that Jesus is saying that Peter, which means rock, Petros, rocky, you are rocky, and on this rock I will build my church. The rock is the confession of Peter. The rock is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that is what the church is built on. This is not arguing for the supremacy of one person over another. We find that nowhere in Scripture. We find that nowhere in the early church. The rock that Jesus speaks about is the very confession that Peter has made. That you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Scripture tells us that no one can lay a foundation other than that which has been laid which is Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 3.11. The church is built on the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. He is the great rock. He is, in fact, the temple of God. He is the promised one. And when Jesus talks about the keys that he gives to Peter, if you will continue in Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew 18, these same keys are given to all of the disciples. It's not one person controlling the keys. It's given to the disciples of our Lord Jesus. What are these keys that have the the power to, um, to bind and to loose? Have you ever thought about that? What are these keys? Peter has confessed, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, you're blessed. That came from God the Father. That's the work of God's grace in their life. It's on this confession, it's on that rock, that the church will be built and the gates of hell will not prevail. This is the work of God. It is Christ's church and He will build it because He is the confession. He is the one that we speak of. And then He says to Peter, to you, have been given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What is that talking about? It's talking about the gospel, brothers and sisters. It's talking about the proclamation of the gospel. The proclamation of the gospel is the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Because when God so moves the human heart to receive the gospel and to believe in it, they are set free. The kingdom of heaven is opened. And when someone rejects the gospel, when someone turns away, that same message is a message of judgment. It is a message that says you are outside the kingdom of God. Jesus uses the same analogy with the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees. He said that your teaching, it shuts the kingdom of God to people that hear you. Your false teaching. In the same way, the truth of the gospel, these are the keys 
And these are the keys that the church are entrusted with. Not just Peter, not just James, John, Andrew, Bartholomew, Matthew, but every believer is entrusted with the proclamation of the gospel. What an amazing privilege. It is not that we decide who gets into the kingdom or not. It is the kingdom of God. The keys are the gospel. And the gospel will only work in the human life by God's grace. Not by flesh and blood. Not by human persuasion. Not by human tactics. And let this be an encouragement to our our UBM brothers and sisters that to you has been entrusted the keys of the kingdom but it is God's work your sacred duty is to faithfully bring that message and entrust to God the work and may God bless you as you go forward He warns his disciples, and this is our last verse. In verse 20, he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. The reason for that we will look at next week. But Jesus knew that people had a completely distorted and warped view of what the Messiah ought to be. The confession of Peter is the bedrock of the Christian faith, certainly. But Jesus, in his wisdom, he knows that the time is not yet right for him to be declared Messiah. But that day would come. And Matthew, in his gospel, will bring us to that place. So in conclusion, our passage today answers the central question, who is Jesus? He is the anointed Messiah. He is the Christ. Because he is Christ, he is king, the final king, the sovereign king over all things. And our allegiance as Christians is to him. He is the son. He is of one essence with the father and spirit. He exists before all creation. In fact, all things were created through him. And in the gospel message, he became flesh and dwelt among us. And this reminds us that from the start to the end, salvation is the work of God for us. Jesus is the son of the living God. There are many dead gods in this world, brothers and sisters. There are many idols. It's not just in Caesarea Philippi that idolatry was rampant. It is rampant in every human heart. But we serve Jesus, who is the Christ, the son of the living God. Let us bring that message to the world. This message which is the very keys to the kingdom. The message of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Let's bow our hearts. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word to us this morning. We thank you for sending your son. And Lord, we we thank you for revealing the truth of that to us. That it was your grace and mercy that have opened our eyes to behold Christ. Your anointed servant, we ask, Lord, that you would open the eyes of this county, Lord, of this country. That you would open their eyes to the work of your Holy Spirit. That you would work in the lives of of the young and the old in Kilkee. That the, the kingdom, Lord, would go forth in your power. And that you would use your servants to faithfully bring that message, Lord. Knowing that you are the sovereign one. That you are the Lord of all. May you fill them with your spirit and your words and your grace to point others to your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let's close with our final hymn.